Wait. The last and finish on the last remaining functional areas of the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is unique in the sense that there are no well-defined external landmarks on the lateral surface. So therefore, we start describing the occipital lobe from the medial surface. So let's take a look at the picture of the brain as we had left it off in the medial surface. Just to bring up to speed, this was the area which we had highlighted as the precuneus, which we had said was the medial continuation of the superior parietal lobule. Let's put a few sulci and gyri in place on the medial surface. Take a good look at this sulcus here. This sulcus starts right from the below the splenium of the corpus callosum and goes all the way up. This is called the parieto occipital sulcus. Why is it called the parieto occipital? Because it separates the parietal lobe anteriorly from the occipital lobe posteriorly. That's why it is called the PO sulcus, the parieto occipital sulcus. Let's bisect this parieto occipital sulcus with yet another curved sulcus. That is known as the calcarine sulcus. When we bisect the parietal occipital lobe by this calcarine sulcus, now we can see that we have divided the medial surface of the occipital lobe into two parts a superior portion and an inferior portion. The superior portion, or more precisely it is referred to as the superior bank, and the inferior is referred to as the inferior bank of the occipital lobe. They have been given specific names. The superior bank, because it is shaped like a wedge, it is called the cuneus. Just to bring you up to speed, let's take a step back. If you remember, the portion just anterior to the cuneus, we had given it a name, we had called it as a precuneus. Now we can understand why it's called the precuneus because it's anterior to the cuneus. So this superior bank is referred to as the cuneus gyrus. And the inferior bank below the calcarine sulcus, because it is shaped like a tongue, it is called the lingual gyrus. These two are the most important areas which are concerned with vision and they are seen best on the medial surface. However, we shall also see them on the lateral surface in the subsequent slides. Now, having put this, put this sulci and gyra in place, let's put the functional areas in their locations. You will see that each of the gyri, superior bank and inferior bank, that is the cuneus gyrus and lingual gyrus, they have got the primary and the secondary visual areas symmetrically arranged above and below the calcarine sulcus. The first here and here, these two lines are the primary visual areas, B1. Rodman area 17, which is responsible for just visual perception only. The next two parallel lines above and below are area 18 and 19, the secondary visual cortex, which are also referred to as B2 and B3. These are for higher order visual perception and for visual recognition. While we're on the medial surface, I need to show you a few other extra points also. Let me put a two other sulci and a few other gyri in place on the medial surface. But mind you, they will not be restricted only to the occipital lobe. They will be spilling over partly also to the medial surface of the temporal lobe. And here we are. We have put another sulcus here. This sulcus is referred to as the collateral sulcus. The collateral sulcus starts from under the lingual gyrus, and as it goes forward, it changes its name and becomes known as a rhinal sulcus. Rhino means nose. It is not part of our present discussion, but I'm just telling you so that we can understand it. The collateral sulcus continues and becomes a rhinal sulcus. And this there's another sulcus lateral to the collateral sulcus, which is known as the occipitotemporal sulcus. With these two sulci in place, let's demarcate the gyri and make a quick mention of the function, because these areas are integrative in nature. They are partly related to vision and partly related to other things. This portion, which is medial to this, to the collateral sulcus, is known as the parahippocampal gyrus. Though it is seen on the medial surface, it is actually present deep inside the medial surface. We will not talk about it any further because it is part of the limbic system. And it is also associated with smell. That's why this portion of the sulcus is referred to as rhinal sulcus. We shall not go into the details right now. Let's focus on this gyrus here and this gyrus here. This was, if you remember, this was the occipitotemporal sulcus. So therefore, the gyrus which is medial to that is known as the medial occipitotemporal gyrus and the gyrus which is lateral to that is known as the lateral occipitotemporal gyrus. Let's focus on the medial occipitotemporal gyrus. As you can see from the term, it is called occipitotemporal gyrus. That's the reason I put it up here. 
That means it extends from the occipital region and goes all the way to the temporal region, but this is seen only on the inferior surface. This area has got again a very unique function. This is Broadman area 37. This area is concerned with facial recognition. The ability to recognize a person by his or her face is a unique. This occipital temporal gyrus is also referred to as the fusiform gyrus. And this has been the subject of a lot of research. And if there is a bilateral lesion of this occipital temporal gyrus, bilateral lesion, the person has inability to recognize faces. And that is called prosopagnosia. In this unique condition called prosopagnosia, we cannot, the patient cannot recognize a person by his or her face. However, when the person speaks, just by hearing the voice, the person recognizes the other person. So that's a unique condition that is called prosopagnosia. So you can see that this is an area of higher order visual processing. It's a very high order visual processing. And this, there are lots of studies going on. So these are some of the important areas that we see, not only on the temporal lobe, occipital lobe per se, but also extending into the temporal lobe, which I have highlighted. Now let's come to the lateral portion, lateral surface, and see. As we have already mentioned, the occipital lobe, there are no clear landmarks on the lateral surface. But occipital lobe does exist on the lateral surface. So in order for us to show you the location of the lateral occipital lobe, what we have done is we have drawn an imaginary line. And because it's an imaginary line, it has not been highlighted in blue like the sulci, but it's been highlighted in black. This imaginary line extends from where the parieto occipital sulcus where the parieto occipital sulcus ended and it went down to a notch on the inferior border known as the pre occipital notch this imaginary line extends from that area and this portion which is, this is an imaginary line there is no landmark on the lateral surface this portion which is posterior to that is the occipital lobe now let's put the other functional areas on the lateral surface of the occipital lobe and see where they go First, take a look at this inset picture. This is the lateral surface. We can see here that the lateral surface also has got the visual areas 1, 2, and 3. Primary visual area, 17. Secondary visual area, 18 and 19. So they not only are they present on the medial surface, but they also extend onto the lateral surface. Incidentally, before I proceed any further, the extreme tip of the occipital lobe is called the occipital pole. And this area is responsible for macular vision. This occupies one third of the entire visual cortex and it serves the macula guide. As we go a little anterior on the lateral surface, we see another large area. Though it has been shown on the occipital lobe, again let me remind you that it is not only restricted to the occipital lobe. It extends into the parietal lobe and it also extends into the temporal lobe. This area is known as the visual association area. V4 is known as the parvocellular blob system. What does this do? This is a very higher order area. It is responsible for, again, facial recognition. That means V4 does send communication to the occipital temporal gyrus. V4 is also responsible for color recognition. And V4 is also a parvocellular blob system. V4 is also responsible for pattern recognition. So therefore, if there's a lesion of V4, parvocellular blob system, the person loses these three functions. Person becomes prosopagnosia, achromatopsia, cannot recognize color and cannot perceive the patterns of objects. And then we have another area, which is also part of the visual association area called V5, the magnocellular stripe system. What does this do? This has got intimate connections with area 7. That's why I put arrows here. This area is concerned with motion, depth, and spatial perception. Therefore, it helps us to determine the speed of objects, the distance of objects, and how far they are from us. These areas, as I said earlier, they are not restricted only to the parietal lobe, uh, to the occipital lobe. They have got extensive connections with area 39, and I told you a little while back, 39 is a very important area, as you can see here. So, they extend to the 39, they extend to area 7. Therefore, this communication of the occipital lobe with the parietal lobe is referred to as a parieto occipital junction. And likewise, this area has also got connections to the temporal lobe, and this is called the occipital temporal connection. Parieto occipital lesion bilaterally produces what is known as balance syndrome, inability to fixate your eyes at a specified point. 
and also we have mentioned also the fibril lesion produces prosopagnosia. So these are the final, and finally there's one more, one more functional area again which is not shown here but it extends to a wide variety, wide area in this region that's known as the occipital eye field which is responsible for involuntary saccadic movements of the eyes.